Oh, what a lad. And man, do I have an absolute lad for you guys for this one. Today's guest is arguably one of the greatest fullbacks to ever play the game. He started off as a Hawks Bay sensation who quickly became a Crusader legend who then went on to become an All Black great. This man has had some journey and it's not just on the footy field either where he's also excelled since footy where he's become a radio and TV star hosting Sen's morning show as well as doing TV commentary and has even recently starred in his own TV show with Beaver, <laughs> Clubhouse Rescue. And as you already know, this man's on this podcast for a good reason. He is one of the greatest lads in the country. It is the one and only Israel Dag. Welcome, mate. Oh, how are you doing, Jimmy Ma? Look, it's an absolute privilege to be on this podcast. I love it because you're actually you're making a difference and you're telling good stories that I think can, can make a hell of a lot of difference. And I think it's only fitting, you know. I'm, a, I'm just a normal lad that uh, had a... Had an awesome time throwing the pill around and, and going on a journey around the around the world, but uh, post footy, just living life and and just really want to share the story and man, I think you do fantastic. Tough act to follow with Timmy Bateman, I must <laughs> say. I've been, I'm, I get nervous at the best of times, but following on Timmy B, hopefully I can uh, share some some wisdom and some gravy for you right out there listening. Oh mate, you do have one of the best journeys uh, <laughs> out there. But you did you mentioned before that yeah. You hadn't been on another podcast before, so super grateful for choosing <laughs> What A Lad as your, your first ever. Oh, I've been asked to share the story plenty of times, and um, look, I've been, I've only really just jumped into to the podcast. I'm still quite new and and still haven't, you know, spread my wings and trying to listen to podcasts, mm. but I obviously listened to Timmy B's and and obviously uh, listened to Fatia Lofa's one mm. and, and obviously the injuries that he went through and... I just think it's it's a perfect kind of platform for myself to share the journey and share the stories and yeah, I was thinking on the way here, I was like, how much do I actually share? Like yeah. when you put that that question, what do you want to ask Izzy Dag? I was like, oh my, what, what, what little <laughs> demons are going to come out up from nowhere and someone's going to ask some sort of question? But I'll be open, I'll be vulnerable, and I'll I'll share it. And yeah, look, it's been an interesting time since I've retired. It's probably been probably the most Difficult time in, in my 34 years of, of age, so uh, yeah, I've just st- jumped into a new industry, was was so um, broadcasting and spreading my wings on TV and mm-hmm. <laughs> trying, to, trying to make a living. It's, um, yeah, I was listening to Timmy B and, and talking about the transition out of rugby, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a difficult one, man, and you probably think, and people on the outside look, think, oh, you know, he's cracked it, he's, he's doing well, but <laughs> mate, honestly... I'm far from far from the finished product, and you know there's still a lot of doubt sex creep into my mind of why well, I'm doing this, what am I doing, who am I? Yeah, you know I'm Izzy Dag. You rattled off all the stats, but um, when you finish, you're like, wow, who am I really? I'm I'm Izzy Dag, the former rugby player. What am I going to be now? Yeah, <laughs> you know, mate, it's crazy because like like you say, from the outside looking in, you're one of the guys who I'd pit right up there as someone who's absolutely nailed their life after rugby transition you pretty much went from rugby straight into tv and then radio when you had shows and you know you're like this big personality new zealand celebrity um <laughs> but deep down you you say you're struggling during that time losing your identity as israel dag the the superstar fullback yeah well it's just one of those things because everyone knows you as izzy dag the rugby player the all black 66 you played test for the for your country the crusaders you know you know, looking along the walls at some of the greats and, and that was a small part of my life and a big part that most people will know me as mm. and it's quite hard because when you finish that's all taken away and you're like okay so what now what are people going to remember me as now um, i am the former player i am a has been i am a washed up former athlete but I've got to try and jump into this other industry and I'll be completely honest I don't think I was going to be in broadcasting yeah um I never went to sc- I never went to broadcasting school I hardly ever went to school and, and, <laughs> was, and actually paid attention and applied myself so that was obviously at the back of my mind but um, I guess the one thing I tried to do when I was playing is is never change who I am mm. who I am as a person like you can get caught up in it and I'll be completely honest I got caught up in the, in the limelight and the spotlight and thought my shit didn't stink and you know you get a bit carried away and, and it wasn't until you get dealt a bit of adversity that actually brings you back and st- kind of makes you realise okay I'm actually not as cool as I think I am mm. so 
you, you still had those those doubts creeping in, and uh, broadcasting was probably way way out left field for me. Yeah. I thought I thought I'd go get a trade or or just go get a normal nine to day nine to five job and just do something. But I guess for me, I I wasn't shy of who I was and who I am and. They saw the potential in me and, and gave me an opportunity to, to transition. So I'm very grateful for Sky Sport that, mm. that giving me that platform to allow me to finish when I was forced to retire. Mm. You know, I retired at 30. I know, young age. Young age, and it was not what I wanted. I thought I'd still be playing, and especially seeing Sammy Whitelock. I've made my day Who <laughs> was Sammy Whitelock, and he's still carving Mate, up. what about Willie Hines? <laughs> <laughs> Willie Hines? <laughs> Willie Hines, like, honestly, like, these boys are just still going on, and... Not looking a day over thirty, like it's so good. But um, yeah, I, my my career got cut short, and I try and tell players these days um, to try and really to plan for that that life when it's mm. all gonna get, come, you know, all gonna end. Not when you when you want it to end, but it's gonna end someday. And and if you don't plan for it, man, it can be scary. And I know you've had plenty of messages, yeah, in, in regards to Timmy Bateman's like. When you finish, it's like, what now? You know, you've got 60 or maybe 50-odd years where you've got to live and you've got to earn. Yeah. And you've got to make a crust. And you've got kids, you've got to pay bills and put food on the table. It's it's difficult. Had you set yourself up pretty well financially for that transition or were you under, were you under pressure straight away? Um, I was lucky, man. I was very, very lucky throughout my career. And it wasn't until I met one of my best mates, um... You'd probably know him, Kurt Gibbons, oh, up, yeah. in, up in Auckland. Absolute wizard. Yeah, he's a wizard. So before then, I thought owning a house was the end. And don't get me wrong, like having your own house, having your own bit of land is is amazing. That's, yeah. a, that's a wonderful achievement. But that's where my mind was at. Mm. And I was very just, I just had a really narrow mindset of, of life after footy. And it wasn't until I met... Him, he kind of opened my mind up and expanded my mind to, to dream big and to to try and work towards um, bigger and, and making life in that transition afterwards. So, having him in my side and having him um, directing me and just heading me in the right direction kind of made that transition for life after footy a whole lot easier. Mm. And I'll be completely honest. But at the end of the day, like you, you're never really settled mm. and you're re- never really comfortable mm. in all reality we've, we've all got to work and we all want to just retire you know they say retirement at 34 you retire yeah. well, when I retired at 30 yeah I retired but the reality is you still got to have something to get you out of bed yeah and motivate you and and, and you know you still got to pay bills man mm. and that's that's the reality so yeah meeting him made life a whole lot easier but uh you shouldn't just stop there yeah you, know? you got to continue to better yourself, to be better and, and educate yourself. Like I'm still trying to edu- educate myself on a daily, learn and and understand who I am as a person. Um, I don't think I'll ever get to that situation when I've finally cracked it and I've made it. Yeah. I think everyone's still on that journey. And it was your knees that forced you to retire, wasn't it? Yeah, it was my knee. So um, I've got knock knee, so my knee's out of line. Um, most people are bow legged. My knee actually goes in, the other way. Oh. Goes the other way. Yeah. Um, so I've got bone on bone. I've got no cartilage. Everything's um, just really bone on bone. So it bruises, it swells. And that forced me to retire when I had no cartilage. In my last two years, I was hanging on. But mm. I thread and it wasn't for the help of. Is that when you're in Japan? Yeah, Japan, yeah. man. <laughs> Japan. I was felt. I fell for the Canon people and Japanese. They thought they'd sign this superstar from from New Zealand. But the reality is, I was just going over to get a little paycheck. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna <laughs> lie. I went over and and I played over there. And it wasn't till um, like I couldn't even step a, a front row. Like I got a lot of respect for our front rows, but. Mm. As an outside back, you should step them up every single time and, yeah. and beat them one-on-one. Over there, I couldn't even do that. And it wasn't until I went to kick this ball. I used to love kicking the ball and try and snap it, smack it down the field. Mm. But it wasn't until over there I went to kick the ball, went 10 metres, and afterwards I couldn't even really walk and flew back, seen the surgeon. He said, look, you you got to retire. The only operation you can do to fix it is called an osteotomy. So I'm getting an osteotomy in, in May. Basically, they cut my knee open, they broke my femur, put a wedge in it, and they put a plate on the inside. Yeah. 
and they realign it. And then 10 years later, I've got to get a whole new knee. True. So I'll be 44 with a little steel knee in my, in my kneecap. Right. So oh, it's, uh, it's, it's been a, a process. And, and that's the thing I struggle with right now. I've always been active, but since I finished, I've been immobile. I haven't mm. been able to move as, as much as I'd I like and, and uh, as much as I had. Um, put on a lot of weight and y- you struggle. So I'm going to get this operation so I can just get some normality back. Mm. Like simple things. You're, you're a father. My daughter was like, can you can you go on your knees and be a horse? Yeah. I'm like, I can't <laughs> even go on my knees, darling. She's like, what? You're young. I'm like, yeah, well, I feel like I'm 60, darling. Come on. So I just want to be able to do that. Just simple things with my kids. Yeah. Go outside and chase them around the backyard. And I said to him one day, You'll never beat me, son. So I still <laughs> got to try and still try to try and get some some gas back in these legs, so he can uh, work hard till he till he beats me one day. Mate, once you get that new knee, you're gonna be <laughs> back at it as a horse around the around the around the backyard. <laughs> yeah, mate. It's uh, I'm looking forward to getting it done. May 23rd. I'll be out for six months. Yeah, uh, it's a long recovery. I'm on crutches for like three months, non-weight, um, but just just need to get it done so I can just. Do normal things as a father. Yeah, I think that's my greatest achievement to date. Everyone asks me, "Is what you know? You've achieved so much. Won a World Cup. You've you've you know won titles for Super Rugby and and what's what and whatever." But being a father, it's my greatest achievement. Doesn't compare. Nothing eh? compares, no, brother. No. Like going home after a shit game yeah. and on the rugby field, you go home and they laugh. Yeah, and you know they don't even care yeah. what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. You're just like, ah. Oh. If only they knew how much I'm getting sprayed by the general public out there in, <laughs> in New Zealand and they don't even you know, care about anything, so it's yeah. so cool. Did you miss footy? Did you miss it once you had to retire? Uh, uh, it's a question I get asked all the time. Uh, mm. do, you, do you miss it? I, I, d- I don't miss the games. Yeah. I don't miss going out there and, and watching these players today. Like You always say it. You, you talk to a lot of the old players that have played yeah. and they've passed on and, and you know handed the baton down it's like, I can't keep up well it's true yeah. like, the game is evolving every single day these players like looking at the skills of some of these forwards like they're all playing like backs so they can move like backs so I do not miss playing yeah. particularly in Fiji <laughs> 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 that would have been horrible playing over there um, but I miss miss the boys you know yeah. I just walked in then and, and checked out my old seat in the change room Seven Reese has it and, oh. you know just those are the times, yeah. you know, you'd know, like in that change room, we're just about to go out on a nice eight degree day in Christchurch and you, you're just having a laugh, the boys are playing music and, you know, you, you know you're, you're setting for one goal is to go down there, you're training hard and you want to get the win in the end, but mm. for me it was just during the week and I'm still one of those hanger honours with the lads, you know, I still yeah. catch up with David Harvilli and, and Richie Moonga and, and a few of the boys, Mitch Drummond. Because um, I just like to stay involved with, with the lads and seeing how they're going. But, uh, yeah, I must I must just been around this, this room. It's quite cool to come in and brings back a lot of memories. Hey, that's what everyone says, eh? It's, yeah. not, it's not the footy. It's not the memories on the rugby. field. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's the boys and, and, and the mates that you meet along the way. It's such, well, such I just, a cool thing. Like everyone said, why would you jump into the sky sport? I'll be completely honest. When I finished rugby, I hated rugby. Yeah. I was like, I want to do something else. This thing has been my life since I was 17. Mm. I want to try something different. And then I got given a sky sport job yeah. <laughs> to go and talk about sky and uh, go talk about rugby uh, on a different level. So, yeah. Oh, look, I, I miss, the, miss the boys. I still enjoy watching rugby, but... Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't miss the game that much. And you finished at Sky now, or are you still doing Sky? Yeah, so I finished at Sky Sport. So I had four years uh, post-Sky, and it was a tough decision for myself to, to make that decision, but when I got this radio gig, I was working every morning, and then on the weekends, like my kids are five and four mm, now, mm. they're playing sport. Like I'd had to fly to Auckland, and it, when I first started, it was awesome. You know, you go up, see your mates, you mm. get to go watch a front row seat to the best games of rugby. But then as time got on and my kids grew and their sports become the priority on the weekend, I just had to make that decision. Mm. And it was a tough decision, but I just um, had to back myself and uh, and turn down the, the opportunity to, to work for Sky Sport. So I, the one door closes, another one opens up, and now I'm just filming the old TV show around New Zealand, yeah. trying to 
renovate clubs around the country with my good mate Stephen Donald and uh, yeah and then soon we're about to head off to France and, and film another show over there so one door closes another one opens that one's a little bit more lenient like I can go up to Auckland during the week yeah. film it with my radio kit so I can cover those two bases and I still get the weekends at home True. so, so it's, yeah, it accommodates so how does what's can you what can you tell us about this um, next TV show over in France, you're on Beaver. Oh, uh, look, it's uh, I, I, I'm not I'm unsure. I got an email the other day if I can share a lot about it. But yeah. me and Beaver just head over to France and uh, just jump in a car and travel around and and just see the sights. Sure, yeah, it's going to be a pretty cool. Watch um, two absolute clowns. Yeah, just traveling around and seeing a bit of the world, and and it's you know it's fitting because the World Cup's here later in the yeah. year and. Yeah, we'll get to see where the best teams in the world are going to be situated. And uh, basically, it's, it's got nothing to do with rugby. I'll be completely <laughs> honest. It's got absolutely nothing to do with rugby. A couple of clowns just travelling around and uh, seeing some sights. Are you in control of the content, or how does that all work? Well, we've got a crew. We've got a crew, yeah. but um, it, it's basically we've got an itinerary. Um, Beaver's looking after one part, and I'm looking after another part. Yeah. And then basically, we just ad lib. We just go along and yeah. the world's our oyster. Yeah, yeah, see what comes kind of through it. on the content, <laughs> mate. So a month away, it sounds all good. I'm going to miss my kids. Yeah. A little wimp there. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it should be fun. Mate, so you are basically the new Mark Ellis, aren't you? And Beaver, Beaver's Matthew well, Rich. I'm not, I'm, not that f- I'm not that funny. So those boys are actually <laughs> quite funny and they're very witty. So it's a hard act to follow, but um, we'll do our best. Just go over there and... Tell our wives we're working. And everyone asks the question, Are they is your family coming? I said, No chance, mate. We might as well go for free if they're coming. <laughs> yeah, should be fun. Oh mate, that's gonna be good stuff. It's gonna be a good watch, no doubt. But mate, um, we haven't even got to the start of it. Let's <laughs> let's start to this at the start for you. So um, growing up, I don't know too much about you before I mm. met you at um, New Zealand under nineteens, I always remember that. But do you remember spraying me in that game? Crusaders, Hurricanes, Hurricanes. Crusaders. But you I, were winding me <laughs> up, man. I've always wanted to talk to you about that. You got under my skin so much. Oh, it really irritated. Piss me right Mate, off. we've skipped, we've skipped <laughs> the whole thing. We've gone straight there. Sorry, mate. Sorry. We just had to. I had to bring I've been wanting, waiting years to get this opportunity this to talk to you about This is the platform, that. definitely. But you know who my influence was my whole career at the Canes? Who? Dane Corey, Coles. Dane Jock, Dane Coles and Corey Jane. <laughs> get under Dad's skin. You get him easy. Oh. I remember that too because, do you know what, um, Ryan Crotty, after, afterwards, I think I like slapped you across the back of the head or something and then he said, oh, get out of here, you grey-haired old man. <laughs> so I was like real self-conscious about like grey hair. So I was like, oh, I got it. <laughs> oh, you won't. You, did, you got me though. I must admit, you got me. Anyway, every time I play the Canes, I just want to take their heads off because they're all my best mates. And it worked every time because it took me away from playing the game. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there would have been some good memories from playing the Canes too. I remember um, bad memories. The mate. bus oh, that one came. Don't up bring in, it up. It came up in the questions. The bus, the bus tackle. Oh, the what, worst. what do you remember about that? Obviously, oh, my, not brother, much. my brother. My <laughs> brother. He let him. Oh, he let him. Tojo. <laughs> Tojo. Tojo. <let> <laughs> he just said touch. We're not playing touch. We're ripping rugby. Tojo. And come then on. you've got him at full steam. <laughs> and then Robbie Fruin was tired, and I was like, "Come on, Robbie, cover up." And then I just got him at full steam. What I remember is I was thinking, "Oh no, here we go." Look, tackling wasn't uh, the best part of my game. I must be completely honest, but I had to try and make an attempt. And it was the worst attempt I've ever had to make. And it wasn't just that one. He actually bumped me twice in that game. Right. And it was a highlight reel that still to this day goes on. Yeah. And what makes it worse is my brother-in-law's and my sister-in-law's son constantly watches it. Yeah. And I'm repeat. getting irritated. I'm like, mate, you get outside. I'm going to bump you. He's only eight. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Wasn't my proudest moment, but anyway. Mate, yeah. It's one of those things, eh? I think it we comes on game. the highlights <laughs> reel, hey, and every year the Hurricanes play the Crusaders is always a memory. And Sky Sport, when I was broadcasting, <laughs> yeah. would play it. And Needed to, to be c- part of your contract. Oh, <laughs> Delete that footage. Stop playing it. Whoever's in the back room. But, uh-huh. uh, yeah, it was good times, but Hurricanes, they always had the ball over me. Mm. Constantly got in my head, and I know what you're doing, mate. <laughs> know what you're doing. <laughs> well, anyway, let's get yeah. to let's get to the start. Let's get to the start of Israel Dag's life. Where'd you grow up? 
What oh, was it like? I had an interesting life. I um, I grew up in, and I was actually born in Martin. Martin. And, yeah, Martin's by Wanganui there, and I ne- I've never been back. I was only there for a week. True. Yeah, <laughs> so born and gone. Born and gone. Sorry the enough. hospital's not even there. <laughs> the hospital's gone, but, you know, the stories that have been told is my family rode in on the horse, picked us up on the horse, and then rode back. We actually lived in a place called Nā Marapuri, which is down the Waitotara Valley, um, Glen Osborne area. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so we lived, we grew up there for a while, and then... I had a, a pretty disruptive life. Um, mum and dad, you know, break up and, and get back together. So there was a lot of moving around. Uh, we moved back to Hawke's Bay, parked up in the bay for a couple of years, went to school there, and then mum and dad split up and, and dad went to Gisborne. And uh, and then we stayed in the Hawke's Bay, and then they got back together, and then we moved to Wairau. Sure. And dad lived in Wairau for, at the freezing work, he worked at the freezing works in Wairau, and then we moved to a place called Frasertown, which is just out of uh, Wairau there, and then they split up again, and then Dad went to Gizzy, and then we went back to Hawke's Bay with Mum, I was the youngest brother yeah. of, of the family, and my youngest sister, we stayed with Mum, so I was the mama's boy hard, Yeah, and um, yeah, they split up for a couple of years, so pretty disruptive, and then Mum and Dad got back together again. All right, and um, and then we all had a family back in the Hawks Bay, and I've got a big family. Yeah, I've got eleven brothers and sisters. Have you? Yeah, true. Yeah, I got a I got a big family. So five in the immediate family. I've, I'm the youngest brother. I've got a youngest sister. Yeah. Um, I've got two other sisters that live in Gisborne. Yeah. So that how that happened is mum and dad split up, and then dad got with another lady, Liz, and I had two younger sisters. Dad uh, had young kids with this lady Liz, and their names are Shona and Cassandra. And then apparently, there's two other young twins that I've never met. Really? That I've never met that live in Dannyburg, apparently. So my sisters met them and said they look exactly like us yeah. and they like exactly like Dad. Um, but uh, I've never met them. So apparently, they're a part of our family. But anyway, and then they break up. Dad and this other lady yeah. with these two kids, and then they mum and dad get back together, <laughs> and, then <laughs> they, and then they got married about six or seven years ago, and they lived happily until uh, mum passed away about a year and a half ago. So, uh, yeah, interesting upbringing, man. So, how come you haven't met the the twins? Oh, uh, pff, I don't know. That's funny. Oh, well, dad says they're not his, but <laughs> they're, they're out. They're 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 his kids apparently, and. Um, I, I've just never had an opportunity to, yeah. to meet them. My sister's made an effort. I've always been down here, so they live in Dannyburg, which is up in North Island, and we've never just really touched base. And yeah. Yeah, they kind of haven't been a part of our family, which is sad. If they were our sisters, we'd love them to be a part of the family. But, yeah, um, yeah they're, they're kind of not. But hopefully we can touch base and, and reconnect because they are obviously our blood and, yeah. and, and a big part of our family. So we've got a huge family, mate, 28 grandkids. Wow, we're, we're a bunch of breeders. I've only got two, so you can imagine all the breeding in the family. Um, so Christmas is a full noise, full yeah. on kids everywhere, cousins. It's um, it's good times. But look, we didn't have many much things growing up. Yeah, you know, disrupted. But one thing we had was we had love, mm. we had support, and we had a lot of care for for us as kids. We never got any. Uh, we never got abused. We never got any sort of. Uh, things that go on in other households, um, we just just had a lot of moving around and moving parts. But we always maintained our love, and and our parents uh, worked extremely hard to to give us all kids the best opportunity in life. Um, yeah, mum worked three or four jobs, studied. Dad was up in the forestry, constantly um, grinding away. And although they there was a lot of disruption, they always gave us a platform and gave us an opportunity, and we always never forget that. Um, but it's a wonderful, it's an interesting story, and I I, I quite like to share it because, um, you know, everyone has a different movie, mm. and whether that's a nice movie with smooth sailing and they've got all everything they could ever dream of, whether it's on the other side where you've got nothing, you've got a lot of disruption. Like, if you believe and and you dream and you work extremely hard at something that you're very passionate about, like anything can happen. Mm. Like you don't need all the materials. I tell a story plenty of times of not even having a rugby ball. Didn't start playing rugby till I was like nine or ten years of age. Oh, true. Yeah, I was a late bloomer because mum, mama's boy. She what, was couldn't like, afford a rugby ball? Couldn't afford a rugby ball, couldn't afford boots. Uh, we used to use a slipper as a rugby ball oh, right. out in our front yard. So my brother 
he bought his new partner home and she bought some new slippers and we, <laughs> we grabbed their new slippers <laughs> and we were playing on the front yard kicking her brand new pink slippers through the power pole there's a power pole standing up and there was a fence on the side and that used to be my goal post so I'd be kicking it and then she'd come home screaming <laughs> my new slippers <laughs> we just kicked them through so that was one of our rugby balls another one was um, just a pillowcase used to fill the pillowcase up with clothes and tie the end on it Oh yeah, and then just go out the front yard and, and use that so right. yeah materials or, or any sort of you know cricket bats just cut a piece of wood up yeah and use that tie a bit of cell tape on the on the on the tennis ball and use that as our nut for yeah. for backyard cricket like that's the thing as kids it doesn't matter what we had we just love sport yeah and we love being outside changes these days like no kids are outside at, at the moment but back then like we played test cricket with a piece of wood we found in the bush <laughs> all day and I'd be fielding all day because my brothers were bullies and they'd make me bowl all day but um yeah it was a, it was an interesting lifestyle but something that I'll, I'll always be grateful for because yeah I just had love and support and although it was a lot of disruption like I allude to all the time but yeah you know, I just want to tell that story because anything's possible. Yeah, so cool. Did, did you find all that moving hard for you to grow friendships? And, like, how many times would you have moved? You sounded like <laughs> 20 plus oh, like we all moved, the time. We moved plenty, man. Yeah. Um, it was hard. It was hard, but, uh, like, we just didn't We didn't need friends. I had a big family, so, yeah. like, well, my brothers and sisters were kind of my mates. And um, Were you changing schools and stuff? Yeah, changing schools. I went to Wairau Primary. I went to Frasertown Primary. I went to Parkvale. Um, where else did I go? Do they all claim you as their... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do. They do. Most of them claim, but um, I don't mind it. I go back and... Because yeah. my wife, lives, she's from Gisborne, so we used to try, drive through Frasertown Primary every every summer because we're going to Lake Waikati Moana. That's our like that's our place we get to and just get away and Frasertown pri uh, Primary was right there and uh, Waikati Moana was right there and we used to stop in and say day. and it's amazing when you walk in there now you're like how small is this place yeah back then you thought it was the biggest school you've ever been to but it's actually quite tiny so yeah look, I love to go back and reconnect and, and just give back to to these schools as much as possible mm. it's particularly um, my high school Lindisfarne College which changed my life yeah I feel so when did you go there? I went to Linnisfarne College in 2002, and, and what changed my life, bro, I was, an, I was an interesting kid growing up. Like, I had a lot of talent, but um, I was pretty easily distracted. Yeah. <laughs> I was in my intermediate years. Like, I was sleeping on the street. Um, I used to tell my mum I'd stay at my mate's house. He used to tell his mum he'd stay at my house, and then we'd just go biking into town and we'd sleep at the library in Hastings there. Why is that? Just because we thought it was cool. Oh yeah, and what drinking or what? yeah. So what we do would get a ten bucks, ten dollars. I don't know where it came. It wasn't my house, but <laughs> someone had ten bucks, and would go sit outside the bottle store, and someone would go in and be like, "Hey mate, can you get us a bottle?" And they'll be like, "Hey," and then you had to keep doing that for the hour, and then someone would agree to it, yeah. and they'd go in and. Get us a bottle of Mad Jacks. I don't know if you remember Mad Jacks, yeah. but Mad Jacks or Kentucky Gold back in those days, just a big hot bottle. It was so bad. But we'd get this bottle, 10 bucks, a bottle of whiskey, bourbon, whatever, go back to the school and just do like nips. Yeah. Oh, we're idiots. <laughs> just thinking we were cool. <laughs> and then go uh, sleep at the library because we weren't allowed home because that's the only way we were allowed to go out is pretend we were staying at each other and back then like phone lines were non-existent in my house couldn't pay the phone bill yeah. so there's no way of finding out just had to take our word but we we're mischievous as anything and we went into that and stealing you know got got a two-year ban from Kmart and did did you? <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I'm telling all this <laughs> what like, did you steal oh uh, you remember the old Simpson socks Back in the day, like these... Oh, like Homer and stuff. Yeah, like Homer, Bart Simpson, like the socks. We used to go... Socks, geez. Shove those down the, down the undies and you used to go hair dye because in the holidays you used to dye your hair blonde but because yeah. I was Māori and, and Ginga, we used to go orange. <laughs> <laughs> so you do the old orange. Um, <laughs> hair dye. I remember when I got caught, actually. I got caught, and that's why I got a two-year ban, is I got caught putting the socks in my undies and they come up to me and they're like, we saw you stealing, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. But they didn't even know. They didn't realise, like, underneath I had a singlet. I had a pair of shorts on. Like, I'd put all these clothes oh. underneath my school uniform. Yeah. 
And uh, they didn't search me. But they gave me a two-year ban, and they got the socks back. But the I got socks home. And socks. Yeah, I got home, oh, and I still it. had a full kit under my <laughs> uniform, man. Like, so that's that's the kind of line and track I was heading down as a young kid. Yeah, just had the potential, love, you know, late bloom in rugby, and I had an opportunity. But uh, without without a doubt, if I didn't go to Linnesville College, I would have continued down that that down that journey of. Just stealing, um, you know, would have been smoking weed, drinking, and mm. probably would have had not not going to be ashamed. But I probably would have had ten kids. <laughs> but you know, like <laughs> that's the kind of life I was I was ever heading towards. So yeah. I had an opportunity to go to private school, Linnesville College, in my um, third form year. Was this a scholarship? Yeah, I got a scholarship. How, so how did you get that? Like, so. Well, it's not education. <laughs> <laughs> it Stealing, was. drinking, sleeping in the library. But I was a young Māori kid. Gifted. Yeah, I was a young Māori kid, and I had a lot of um, people in that I played. I played for this Ross Shield team, uh, Hastings East, and the, it's the, ra- the railway lines in Hawke's Bay have the separation, so you got ha- Hastings West, you got Hastings East. So on the east side, there's Hastings Intermediate, so that was my intermediate, but there was also schools like Heroworth, Heroworth Intermediate, which is a private intermediate, and then, um, you know, Havelock North. Mm. So really kind of proper, prestigious kind of intermediates. And so I had a really good family-orientated team that I was amongst, but obviously I was heading in the wrong direction. So a lot of these kids went to Linnesville College, and they just gave put in the good word for me, and they kept approaching my mum and dad and saying, look, I think Izzy's got so much potential. The mm. school would just do him wonders. Um, the only way I could potentially it's like twenty thousand a year to go oh, there, true. so it's very expensive. We didn't have twenty thousand to take me there, but I got given a, a scholarship called the Tafaiti Nui Toy Scholarship to to head to Linus Farm. So I had an opportunity, and I had a decision to make: whether I go to school with all my best mates and go to Hastings Boys, mm. or I make the decision to go to Linus Farm College. Only opportunity, only option I had to go to Linus Farm was to be a boarder. And I lived in Hastings. So I had to, I went to this boarding school. I made that decision. I went to Linnesville College. I went to this boarding school, and wow, we was that a wake up call for mm-hmm. myself, going from doing what I want to being told to get up, go pick up the rubbish, go sweep the driveways, go change all the seniors, uh, get all the seniors' laundry put on the laundry, go set up the dining room table. Like it was a big wake up call for me. Yeah. But uh, it took a few years to get used to it, but without a doubt, saved my life. Mm. Heading to that school just saved my life because I was heading in a direction that right now I don't mind sharing, Yeah, but wasn't proud. Yeah. So what, why did you choose to go there? Like, it must have been a tough decision. Like, obviously I hated the it. easier option would have hated been it. to stay. So what, what was the deciding point for you? Did you just think you didn't want to go down that route you were going? I'll or? be honest, I got forced. <laughs> <laughs> so when you say it was your decision. Yeah. That, I kind of got forced. Yeah. Uh, Mum was begging me, just give it a chance, give it a shot. Yeah. You know, I was leaving my best mates that were going to this other school, and I was yeah. like, oh, okay, I'll give it a chance. <laughs> so I lasted one year. In third form at Lindisfarne College, and then at the end of the year, I was like, started to catch up with my mates. Got to catch up with my mates. So I came back to mum. I said, Mum, I want to get Hastings boys. I'm yeah. done. You know, I've had enough. I hate boarding, and I ran away from the boarding house for the first two weeks. Did I you? got real bad homesickness. Yeah, yeah. we so just stay at the library. <laughs> no, I didn't go back to the library. My <laughs> nan lived up the road. Oh, like true. Two hundred meters. So I ran there every weekend or every night. I had an opportunity. And yeah. Ran away, so I struggled for the first year, but the second year, sh- I said, I want to go to Hastings Boys. She said, well, you got an op- option here. You give it one more crack, you can be day boy, mm. or you can go to Hastings Boys, and, and that's enough. And uh, so she genuinely, genuinely wanted me to stay there, so I said, okay, I'll stay there. But the only downside to it is mum worked at like 4 or 30 or 5 in the morning Oh yeah. so I had to go to school for my in the whole 4th from year at 5am <laughs> <laughs> and I'd just go hang out in the gym and just shoot hoops and just oh, sit yeah. there and I felt like I lived at that school I was there for that long so that was the only downside and then I got to the end of the year I, I just turned a corner and and just seen the good that the school was absolutely doing for me and, and the reasons why I needed to stay there. And then in my fifth form year, I went back to the boarding house and stayed on and had the best three years mm. of my life. And, yeah, very, very grateful that mum stayed true and Linus Farn actually stayed true and yeah. and kept the faith in me. And, yeah, 
and here I am today. Mate, that's so cool. And is that when sport took over, like that sort of fifth form year? Is this when you became to start? I remember you, you were playing for Hawks Bay at about 15, <laughs> so mate, it must have been about this time. Um, full form was actually the year I started making a change. It was it? I made the change in, in cricket, actually. I, oh, yeah. I, I love my cricket playing up, playing in high school. Absolutely dedicated to the sport. I used to try and whip it down there and have you're a bowling one forty. <laughs> eh? it's a ridiculous age. Oh, I, I was waiting to see it on the black clash, but nah, <laughs> mate. Like, like I said, it's I'm bowling one forty back then, but I was about thirty eight kilos lighter, <laughs> so I could move, but not these days. Um, so yeah, full form. I actually just I started playing cricket. I made the first eleven in full form, and then I got a crack to play first fifteen at. at at four form as well, so That's I had a, crazy. Had a wee form crack. So young too, <laughs> I know, I was a, but I was only allowed to play one. Oh, so the yeah, the, one, the, yeah. the coach had to go and beg my mum to play, oh, and yeah. mum said, "Yep, you can only play like one or two games, and, and that's it." Like, did I'm you just, know you were you were gifted, or nah, you, know you were like, good, or honestly, everyone asks. I never, I never had that belief. I still don't have the belief now. Like, you struggle yeah. to believe in yourself. I didn't believe until it actually happened. Yeah. So you get announced, you know, like. Back then, you're just a kid playing the game and you love it, but reaching those heights that I was able to was just felt too far away, mm. you know, like unachievable for for me, a young kid from Hawke's Bay that you know grew up with the the things that I've seen and mm. been through. Like, mm. you know, how am I going to be able to achieve it? So I didn't believe it or think it was going to happen until it actually happened. So um, yeah, started from a young age, just played throughout the high school and. And then in my seventh form year, I got a contract to play for Hawke's Bay and that kind of made my decision up for what I wanted to do. And that's the reason I got kicked out of school early because I didn't go to school <laughs> in my seventh form year. So I got uh, I got shafted early. Because you were playing at yeah. NPC at the time. How bad is this? Like, seventh form, my wife Daisy, she just left school and she was at EIT, but I was staying with her. We get called into a principal's meeting with the principal. My girlfriend and a student getting pulled into the principal's office. So she has to. Tr he's trying to encourage Daisy to make sure I turn up to oh, school. Oh, true. Because <laughs> that was like the the contract. Like, is he? He can play for Hawks Bay Magpies in a sim form year, but he's still got to come to school. But yeah, man. I was training at six a.m. I finish at eight, and then I have got to go to school and and listen all day, but. I didn't, and then got to the end of the year, got, got the boot. <laughs> so when did you get together with Daisy? Oh, young, man. We've been together for 18 years. 18 years? 18 wow. years. Half my life. Met her at 16. 16. 16, Jeez. man. Like, so, you met her at high school. She was, uh, I was fifth form, or, si or sixth form. Fifth or sixth form, and she was seventh form. So she was a little bit older than me, and yeah, met her at high school, and, and just, been together forever and, and the reason I, l I love Daisy is like she's been there from the start yeah you know she's been there from when I was getting her to drop me off and I'd say yep this is my house and then she'd drive off and then I'd run to my actual house <laughs> 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 so we've been together for that long like on the weekends no money, yeah. but she'd take me down to the local kebab stop shop. Would have um, you know TV three movie night, and we'd yeah. go home. She'd shout me kebabs. Uh, if we went for our one year anniversary at a place called Corn Exchange, and we get to the end, and I'm doing the hucker because I got no <laughs> cash, <laughs> and I'm just gonna go to the toilet here. Come back, and she's paid the bill. Like she's been there from the start. She's been through all the roller coasters of emotions. Success, some some adversity, yeah. Um, and she's given me the greatest gift I've ever, 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 ever had mm. with two beautiful kids. So, eighteen years, mate. She knows everything, so she'll oh. know if I'm lying on this. <laughs> <laughs> mate, that is a that is an achievement. Eighteen years, that's impressive, mate. I don't know how how she stuck <laughs> with us. <laughs> But then you get contracted by Hawke's Bay, you play um, your first NPC game at, what, 18 or might even have been younger, but, and yeah, you, you look natural out there straight away. How, how was it? How did you feel playing that first game at such a young age? I was nervous, man. Yeah. Absolutely nervous because I've gone from playing kids, teenagers, to fully grown men and... Playing against Counties Monaco, you know. Was that your first game, Counties? Yeah. Oh, true. Yeah, like it was um it was a pretty pretty rude awakening for for myself, like just a young kid that loved playing the game to actually having to be fully committed, like 
I never went to the gym. That's why I still look like this because I still don't go to the gym. Like <laughs> going from just being a kid that loved playing rugby to actually having to be a professional was was a difficult transition. And then you're facing these these fully grown men, and mate, they're just so much bigger, faster, and and you're just wondering how am I going to go? Mm. So in my first year, I actually got knocked out like five or six times. True. Yeah, and those are the days where you just roll straight back in. Yeah. There's no like. HIA protocols or anything like that like you just oh well, you'll be right mate get up and go again next week so I got knocked out big time and that's uh, Mike Anthony he's the high performance officer for NZR he's on the case study of why they have limited numbers uh, minutes for players that oh, are playing at a young age yeah, yeah. because of what happened to, to myself yeah because I just got knocked out and, and just continued to play and I got knocked out in a, in a nothing game against Counties Monaco, and I actually missed playing for New Zealand schools in my final year. So, one of the one of the hard times, and, and it was pretty tough. I wanted to play for New Zealand schools with all my best mates, yeah. and I wasn't able to because I got knocked out. But anyway, things happen, and yeah. Mate, I'm surprised you never went to the gym. Like I remember, <laughs> I remember meeting you. Why at you under, surprised? <laughs> un, <laughs> under 19s. Yeah. Um, you obviously playing. I'd seen you on TV. I was ten fullback. You were a fullback, and I remember just seeing you stroll in. And mate, your arms were bigger <laughs> than my legs. So I was like, man, this guy is an absolute gun. <laughs> I won't be able to go for fullback. I might as well try ten. And <laughs> um, well, that was uh, that was Grant Dunes at Hawks Bay Magpies. Like, yeah, he we trained hard. Like when I made it, that's when I started training oh, yeah, and putting my hard. body and and going to the gym like every day and running and, and doing what's what's needed because you just can't get by like some of these athletes I'm looking on the wall mate, they're just absolute specimens yeah so I, I started late gymming late but yeah. um you just have to have to commit to it and, and get through it and, and spend those spend the money in the gym mm. as we make your games and did you start feeling more confident the more you're playing or you sort of spoke about before you had this self-doubt all the time did was that whole way through or did did you start getting more confident um, after performances? I, I don't know. That self-doubt will always be there, I feel. Uh, look, I guess when I was younger, I probably had it less because there was no expectations, there was no pressure on yeah. me. And, you know, I'm just a young kid that's going out just there play, to play. And, yeah. and no one's, you know, that's all you play like. And you just play free world, free-spirited, and you just want to go out there and, and do what you do. But it's not till you get older and you get more experience, the, the external pressure you put on yourself, you know, the the um, pressure that people from the public put on you as, mm. as well. So, uh, you, uh, But I, I look at pressure as... Pressure is probably more pressure from yourself to perform. Like, yeah. You think pressure is, is more than it actually is, and I think that's the kind of learning curve that I had to be deal with when I got older. Like, You felt like yeah, everyone, five million people were watching you, judging you every single move. You dropped the ball, you're thinking, what stuff article's going to be written? But... That's what was going through my head, and I think that's what kind of made the self doubt more than it actually was. Yeah. Um, so I had to learn a lot, but back when I was younger, man, like I just didn't have a care in the world. Yeah. I had no kids, I had no booze. <laughs> I was just playing rugby, getting paid, and driving c around in a car. I never had a car, and and doing things that I never thought I'd ever ever do. Yeah. So back then, I was just young and just played. And, and really had some fun with it. And the rise happened pretty quick for you too, eh? Like you went from NPC to Super to All Black yeah. all really quickly. So how was that rise? Obviously Highlanders to start. A lot of people <laughs> forget that you started off as a Highlander, but yeah. it's where it all started for you. Yeah, the Landers, the Landers. Look, the rise, it was, it was an interesting one. I remember Hawke's Bay having a wee crack there and they had a go at, at the under-19s and we went over to Belfast and then that fell into place and... And then that finished, and I was thinking, man, I'm playing for Hawke's Bay again. What's going to happen next? And then I got a New Zealand, New Zealand Sevens. That's right. NZ Sevens thrown at me. And I, a young kid thinking, all I heard about was Titch. Yeah. Titch, you're going to be running this. You're going to be just running all every single day. I got the call from Gordon Titchens. Hey, is he? Um, Gordon Titchens here. I'm like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Titch. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> Do you want to come have a crack at New Zealand Sevens? I was like, oh, yeah, okay. Um, went and did Sevens and absolutely loved it. Yeah. Absolutely loved it. The trainings were just crazy. 
crazy hard and um, and tough. But mate, what a, what an opportunity for a young twenty year old to travel around the world. You know, my first tournament was in Dubai. Mm. Head over to Dubai, play sevens here, and then jump on another bird and fly to South Africa. Yeah. Can go to South Africa, come back, go to Hong Kong, go to Adelaide, go to United States, play in San Diego, go to Scotland, England. Like, it was just crazy. So, that was a whirlwind year. But at the end of that year, I was like, I can't do this again. I cannot do this again. The only way, reason, the only way I'm going to stop doing this again is crack super rugby. <laughs> <laughs> so I just went handy at ITM and went hard, played some some nice solid rugby. I was actually in the um, Hurricanes region. And, yeah. and back then, my dream was to play for the Hurricanes. True. I was a young uh, oh, captain of Hurricane. Been? You know, Tyler Umanga, the Hurricanes bus going through the Hawks Bay, Christian Cullen, Jonah. I was thinking, man, I want a, I want that. Yeah. I want that. And I was hoping and praying that I'd get picked up for the Hurricanes, but no, they chucked me in the draft. Did so they? back then, they, you could... Who did they take? Um, well, I actually... Don't know. Ah. Some guy, Corey Jane, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you can only secure a certain amount of players yeah, yeah. in your region, yeah, and then right. they get thrown in the draft. So that's the reason I went down to the Highlanders. Pete Russell got an opportunity to coach down there with Glenn Moore, and uh, I got thrown in the draft. I went to the Highlanders and uh, absolutely loved it. Loved it. Two years down there. I played 2009, and at the end of that year, actually, the Crusaders were chasing me. And... I was so close to signing, so close to signing, like, because I wanted to to go and see what this Crusaders outfit was about. Yeah. Um, I didn't. I stayed loyal, and I stayed on for one more year. And then 2010, they chased again, Todd Blackadder, and, and gave me an opportunity. The Hurricanes chased again, but I said, <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> you chuck me in the jar, a few buggers. Nah. Um, but, yeah, went to the Crusaders and, and been here ever since, man. Yeah. 2010, I moved here. I, n- I nearly went to the Chiefs in 2013. Yeah. Sonny was here, Wayne Smith was here, and it was, I was so close because I wasn't playing well here. And, you know, we'd just been through so much, and I was living in a shoebox, and I just wasn't really feeling it here. Yeah, yeah. So I nearly made the decision I didn't, and I'm so grateful I didn't because uh, this place has got a big place in my heart now. Yeah. I'm a Hawks Bay, North Island lad through and through. Never, ever thought I'd stay in Christchurch, but this is home. Yeah. It's the same for me. So what why did you go choose the Crusaders in the end? Like what was the deciding factor there to make that move? I just always remember watching them growing up and thinking they're just so good. Yeah. They're just so good at at, at what they do. You know, they 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 win. They look like they just work extremely hard and, and look I'm not going to lie, they had superstars of the game. Mm plan here so I had an opportunity to rub my shoulders with some of the best and I thought I knew everything I thought I was a, a professional I thought you know I understood the game the analysis that's involved um, you know what you need to put into your body recovery just what it takes to be a professional athlete mm. I thought I knew that but come here I knew nothing mm. you knew nothing John Snow so <laughs> <laughs> so it's like um, I just had to um, you know where I wanted to get to this was a great opportunity for me to to better myself as a, as an athlete, but better myself as a person, and mm. that was one of the main reasons why I wanted to come. I just want to like you coaching, you know, like you you've been the Marco, you've been Taranaki, you've been yeah you know, the Hurricanes, and you outside looking in, you're like, I really want to know. We deep down we hate them, mm. but I want to know why they're so good, and yeah. so that's why I wanted to to get an inside look and um, constantly get asked why they're so good and. I won't share that secret. But <laughs> <laughs> until you've been a part of it, that's that's the reason why. Yeah, but your time at the Landers, you obviously you got a lot of game time, which you probably wouldn't have got if you came down here. Mate, very grateful, very grateful for that. Like, mm. I wouldn't have had game time like I had at other franchises like the Hurricanes. They would have had, you know, Corey Jane was playing fullback. They had some quality wingers. Zach was there playing wings. So yeah. the game time would have been very limited. So I'm very grateful for what the Highlanders did for me. Like. They put me on the map. Mm. They put me on the map, a young kid, and I was playing every single week and getting 80 minutes Yeah, um, through and through. So, uh, yeah, like, with, without a doubt, very great. It was a hard decision to leave. Mm. It was a hard decision because I knew what they had done for me um, as a young kid, getting an opportunity. I felt like we were close. 
You know, I was playing um, with Ben Smith. Mm. He's he's turned out to be not bad at all, <laughs> one of the greatest ever. So, you know, we both started our career there, and and I always hold the Hollanders close to my heart for for the opportunities that they gave given me. But mate, all my mates were at uni there, mm. so I had to get out of there, man. It was. <laughs> Yeah, I was uh, I wasn't good role model. I was kind of reliving my intermediate days when I went to Dunedin. <laughs> All the university students. I was I went to the last ever night at Gardies. Yeah, that's showing my age. Oh, true. That was a big night, huge night, and it was midweek. Probably had a game that Saturday. <laughs> so was it like the stories are true down there? They do love their purse. They do. It is a slightly different oh, culture mate. to what it is here. They love their beer. Mm. They love their booze. And I was, yeah, I was young, so I was midweek, just cruising around. Like, I told the story the other day. We're on a lad pod- podcast, so I'll share the story. Yes. So, we were at Gardy's that night, and it was a good night. Mm. Big night. Absolutely heaving. The last night, like, that is, everyone knows Gardy's that's listening. You'll know Gard. It's the place to go down the end of Castle Street, all the students venture upon this place and just have a hell of a night. So, I was lucky enough to go last night. And we, the end of the night, we were walking outside. And I get outside and all these people start chanting, Izzy's on the purse, Izzy's on the purse, Izzy's on the purse, Izzy's on the purse. purse." Anyway, I get on this car. I jump on this car and I start dancing and dancing and dancing and having a wee boogie. And I don't know what crossed my mind. But then I jump on the windscreen, I stomp it in. Oh, true. Full stomp, this windscreen. So apologies, if that's your car, I'm so sorry. (laughs) Um, it wasn't a student, it was this dumbass rugby player that <laughs> thought he was being cool, so I apologised for that. And then Campus Wash chased me down the road and I got away. Oh, wow. So one of my darkest secrets I've told, mate. Jeez. On your <laughs> car, so. Wasn't expecting that. Yeah, yeah, so I stopped this car. And then, uh, was this just a chant, the chant got the you? The chant got me and I got on top of me, I got fully excited and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I just got carried away and so I apologised for that. But uh, yeah. Got chased down the road by a campus watch, got away, and George and I opened my flatmate, picked me up, took me home, and oh. the rest is history. And there's no the one story. <laughs> no one knew. <laughs> no one knew. <laughs> but oh. then you, okay, then you move up to the uh, Crusaders, mm. um, you have a good year here, and then is it from there you make the All Blacks, or how did your All Black call up come about? Oh, I made it at the Hollands, actually. Oh, did you? Yeah, 2010. So the end of 2010, so what had happened, 2009, is I was playing, I was playing okay. Yeah. Playing solid rugby, but. I was a bit, bit overweight, I felt, because I got, got caught up in the lifestyle. <laughs> so, end of that year, Graham Henry actually come down, and uh, he come down and had a chat with us, and started talking to potential players, and he pulls me in, and starts coming up to me, and I'm like, oh, here he is, Ted, how yeah. you going, Ted? And he comes over, and he goes, yeah, you're looking a bit tabby. <laughs> <laughs> Full noise, straight up. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and I was. Like, yeah. if you know your skin folds, I was... I was high, like one, one ten. Oh wow! Like yeah. big boy. Jeez. But I was still moving. Yeah. I was still playing all right. Goose, so I yeah. thought, I thought everything was okay. So I didn't make it that year. And they actually took Ben Smith and, and Zach Ilford. And uh, I was pretty gutted. Hey, eh? I was pretty deflated. So the next year I came back. I just had to make better decisions. Mm. You know what am what, what do I want to do? What do I want to achieve? So got my body in nick. Got my body in shape. Um, started playing all right. And then got caught up for the All Blacks at the end of 2010 in my 2010. I think I was 20, 20, 21, and I was a young kid. So I got yeah. caught up to the ABs and made the All Blacks. And I thought, oh, yes, sweet as, I'll get eased into it. But no, first team meeting, Mills Molina's injured. Israel Dag, fullback. And I'm like, oh, wow. True. So no easing my way into this. Yeah. And just got thrown in. We played um, Ireland. Ireland. Yeah. Ireland, in the necky, too, mm. wasn't it? That's right. Mm. All right. So that's how it all happened. Did you feel comfortable or confident or nah, is this you, not you at all. shitting your pants? Shunting, man. Yeah. Like I said, I was like, yeah, I might come off the bench and test three or just ease my way into it. Yeah. Nah, fully starting, roomy with Mills, you know, and then I, I was nervous because I didn't want to let the team down. I didn't mm. want to let legends down, man. Richie, Dan, and players I grew up watching, yeah. you know. High school, I had a... Hotmail called Izzy Carter doc at hotmail.com <laughs> and now I'm playing with them. Come on, like, what is this? So I, I just didn't want to let them down, I didn't want to let my, my nation down, like the, the <laughs> Izzy Carter. 
<laughs> as he part of me. <laughs> and, so I, good. <laughs> and I told him when we were sitting in the change room behind us, I said to him, mate. I said my email is he cardo at dot hotmail dot com and he goes, "Are you all right? <laughs> what a loser!" <laughs> and I was like so deflated. I was like, "Bro, don't be like that. That's what you meant to me." But now I really know you. Oh, I don't know why I did that. <laughs> um, so that, that's kind of why I was nervous. I was just yeah. putting those expectations and nerves on myself, and just the enormity of it. Like you're playing for the All Blacks, a team you've watched. For so long, and now I'm out there doing the anthem and the haka. It was the longest week, yeah. the longest game day ever. I was rooming with Jerome, uh, Joe Rockathoko, and um, yeah, player I watched score four tries against Australia. And now he's next to me. Yeah. Um, so it was a long day, but I was lucky. I just I used those nerves in the right way, and I was lucky that the game kind of went my way and and had yeah. a solid little debut there. And solid, mate. It was one of the great <laughs> debuts. But it's it's <laughs> crazy to hear that you. Had all the self doubt, and you're like oh. you're shitting yourself because you 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 watch your debut from afar, and you're mm. like, man, this kid's so confident. He's just playing footy. He looks so relaxed and chucking out gooses <laughs> everywhere. Just just playing what he sees, and it definitely didn't look like you were in your head at all. Like like oh. you speak about, they just give you the the tools, eh? When you're yeah. in there, you know, like the, the the training week's just high pressure, so you kind of get to the game. It's it's, it's a it's a breeze and the age is, is it helps you know because you're young and although you want to do well everyone doesn't really know if you are going to do well or not yeah. so you don't have that that pressure or or you know expectations on yourself so I guess when you're out there and you're young just go out there have fun get the mm-hmm. ball and run and I if if the first kind of play comes off or you have a little bit of gold in that first movement. I feel like I'm one of those players. Confidence. So you got under my skin early, <laughs> so it's going to be a long day. <laughs> Whereas if I got off to a flyer, come stay with me now because I'm going to go handy. Oh, so that's what CJ told me. Here you go. <laughs> that's what CJ told me. So if you're playing golf with me, get under my skin. If I shank it, it's going to be a long day. <laughs> <laughs> that's so good. But your All Black career wasn't just your day, but it was the next few tests as well against... South Africa, a couple that I remember where you scored a couple of unreal tries. One, I think at Westpac, where you, you <laughs> throw out a big goosey on Pierce Spies and break about five tackles and score. Bro, if you watch that clip, you watch me and watch me running around, I got no idea. <laughs> I had no idea where I wanted to be, where I was going. Like, I was playing wing. Oh, true. So uh, I was meant to go on for Mills and Mills go to wing and I go fullback. Oh, yeah, yeah. But I said, nah. I'll just jump on the wing. Didn't even train there all week. Yeah. Didn't even know. And so if you watch that clip, yeah, I, I was in no man's land. But I guess you know, wing's pretty similar to fullback. You kind of just roaming around and and getting yourselves into to positions. Oh, that was that was just fluky. Turn us, <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> grab the ball, have a goosey. Like I don't know how they fell for it because I dummy cut Owen Franks. No disrespect, <laughs> Franksy, but I was never giving you the ball. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah, and it just happened. It came off, and and that's a that was a cool way to to start the my first try in the yeah. black jersey and. And and got it done, and then I was an idiot later in the year, and I nearly read and dead. I'm constantly being reminded of that, eh? <laughs> yeah, it comes up a lot, eh? <laughs> it does. Seeing clips everywhere on socials about you talking about Oh, that, someone the other day said, I watched that clip when you nearly went, um, um, and he stumbled. I said, dead. And he goes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh. Yeah, mate. I just like to keep you on your toes, you know? <laughs> keep you guessing. Was it, was it just that? You were just nah. so... I was young. Yeah, and what, didn't think about the dead ball line, or...? Oh, it was a hell of a try, eh? I, never what was sell, well, I uh, did nothing, really. Ma did all the work, and I nah, just finished the, it off. <laughs> the moment, the occasion of it, eh, was... 98,000 people. Scores were locked, 22 all. Yeah. 98,000. And I was 21. You are in, in the South clear. Africa. You know you're scoring so from like, about 22 out. Let's go. It's going to be a good <laughs> night. <laughs> now, I don't know why I did it. Look, I, it's a big, it's a, it could have been a hard lesson learned. You know, imagine, if, hey. if have, you, have you thought dead, about yeah, it? Yeah, man. Like, imagine being the mug that cost the All Blacks the game, and you know they could have had a try and and put the ball down. Like it happened to Rico a couple of years ago in yeah. Wellington. Like, it can go the other way. So I always tell the story now. Like, carry the ball in two hands, um, put the ball down. Do not celebrate before the try. I got, a, I got a, I got a real growling for that. 
I got ripped to shreds. Mills actually said to me, well, don't celebrate ever again. I don't even know what he's on about. I was like, yeah. what, do you, what do you mean? So I do think of it on the other side, like if I had went dead, what would have happened? Yeah, wow. Uh, I would have been a class clown instead of a, a hero. So How yeah. close were you? I was probably like, I don't know, 10, uh, 15 centimetres. So you genuinely feel like you potentially could have been dead. I could have been dead. Yeah. Well, well I actually got caught up in the moment. Yeah. Like, 98,000 people, I'm like, looking around, ding, 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 and then I'm like, oh, I better put Small the Small angles. <laughs> and then I died, and then I was like, I should have died, like, yeah, on yeah, my yeah. arms, but I put one arm out just to keep it even closer. <laughs> <laughs> and it just about did go out and dead, but rest of history, we had a good night. Yeah. <laughs> it was a good night, I bet. And did the coaches hit you up? Oh, yeah, I got sprayed, man. Oh, did they? Sprayed in the changing rooms plenty because um, I was sitting there in typical Corey Jane fashion. We're having a laugh, having a wee giggle, and then Steve Henson comes and taps me on the shoulder. He's like, how you going, cock? I was like, oh, good. How are you? He goes, don't you ever <laughs> celebrate before you put the ball down again. Don't ever do it. Rip me to shreds. And I'm like, oh, oh okay. And then he walked off, and then I was like, to CJ, I was like, doesn't he know I just won us the game? Scored the match winner. <laughs> and like, I was like pumping my chest, like having a little laugh. And then CJ gets up, tells the coach um, that I said that, and then he looks around and gives me the eye. And yeah, I got <laughs> sprayed again. CJ. But uh, all the senior boys sprayed me, Steve Anson sprayed me, and yeah, the lesson learned. Could have right. went the other way. So CJ, do not. Do not, you know, see, don't, don't share your secrets. Oh, with him, mate. thinks he's very, he is very witty. I must give him that. Yeah, but, mate, just don't tell him anything. <laughs> <laughs> Big mouth, or oh, wah, <laughs> mate. And then the next year, massive year for the country, rugby world cup year. Um, were you confident you were going to make that squad on the form you were playing? Um, I wasn't actually, no, nah, I wasn't confident, but like, I, I actually tore my quad off my hip that year. Oh, did you? Yeah, so I was over in South Africa and we are playing against the Stormers in Cape Town and I kicked the ball and when I kicked it, I just heard this, like, ping. Oh, that's right. I yeah. do remember that. And I kicked it and then, my, so what happened is my abductor, I tore my abductor off my hip and it just, like, flapped down and it was at the bottom of my knee. Was this the year you guys travelled everywhere? Yeah, that was yeah, the uh, earthquake right. years. Earthquake, so we were, yeah. we were travelling every week. So I did that. I tore my abductor off my hip. I had to come back. And this was like, I think this was about May. So mm -hmm. I had three, four months to get back and get my back, uh, self back sorted. So after that, I was like, nah, I'm no chance. Oh, I've got to yeah. go get surgery. So they had to pull my hamstring, uh, my abductor up and reattach it and, and get it going. And then I had, I had one, uh, 20 minutes of club. And then I had 40 minutes of MPC and then I had one test match to make the World Cup. So okay. I, had th I had three opportunities. And look, I'll be completely honest. In that time, I was I was living in Christchurch alone because mm. the team was travelling every week. Mm. So I, d I didn't, like, when in terms of preparation and getting yourself back to where you need to be, I wasn't giving myself many opportunities and mm. me, me, a solid chance. Um but some sort of miracle happened. I got I got back. I got fit really quick, and I got myself into shape. And I got three opportunities, and I played against Havelock North and, and Napier for the Pirates, and we won the Madison Trophy. There was a bit of a dilemma there because I came back and and just played in the final. Oh, and true. <laughs> we actually won it. <laughs> so it was like I claimed my claim to fame. I won the Madison Trophy there in the Bay. Um, and then I had an opportunity to go f to play against Bay of Plenty for Hawke's Bay, yeah. 40 minutes with Zach. We won that game and uh, had another opportunity to fly to South Africa, and we played South Africa and Port Elizabeth, and we actually lost that game. Oh. But I actually I actually went all okay, and yeah. I actually played some, some solid rugby. Then they named the team after that, and uh, I obviously did enough in, in that last game to, to warrant selection for the All Blacks. So... I didn't think I'd crack it, no doubt. With injuries, you know, not opportunity, limited opportunity to play any rugby, I thought, nah, it'd be a long shot. Yeah. Uh, obviously did enough and and got the job and, and then got an opportunity to play in that World Cup at home, which was amazing, man. Yeah. I'll never, ever forget. That was eight weeks of um, 
intense pressure. Yeah. I know you want to try and bring up that moment, eh? Mate, I, I, <laughs> you know, I always ask the questions. You spoke about the questions before. Like 90% of the questions are about what actually happened that night. Oh. I guess it's something, Honestly, something you live with. The question, now, eh? yeah. the question where they, yeah, I look, I, it's something I get asked all the time, yeah. and it's something I have to live with, and it's something I'm very ashamed of because Mills Moreno, that was his week, it was his hundredth test. Oh yeah, he was playing his hundredth test for his country, and selfish Israel and Corey Jane just thought would take it all away from him and take the spotlight away from him. So I'm, I'm not, not proud of that. At one, but it was uh, it was a tough time, and I'm glad I didn't have kids. And my kids will probably read about it one day and and listen to this podcast about what went on. Look, we were just young, and no, there's no excuse. We we knew the right from wrong. Yeah, and we made a bad decision. We were in the massage, and those are the time the days where sleeping pills were very accessible. Yeah, we took uh, a couple of sleeping pills and. Um, we're on the massage table, and the reason you take them because you just go into la la land, and and you just you feel like you know we're always tracing an adrenaline rush, and that was our adrenaline rush. Yeah, took the sleeping pools, and then got to we had to go out for dinner. So me and Corey, and uh, me and Corey and Zach went out for a feed, three amigos, the trio they used to call <laughs> us, and <laughs> and then it just went blank, and I can't remember, I anything. remember anything. And then all I remember waking up. Is next to Corey Jane and looking over and going, Corey Jane, what are you doing in my bed? And we're like Marae living styles. We yeah. had mattresses all on the floor and Pity Weepoo was my roomie. And I was like, what are you up to? He's like, oh, I don't know. That was a mean sleep, eh? And I was like, oh, I'm feeling a bit unwell. I look up and Pity goes, you idiots. And we were like, what? He didn't say anything. Yeah. And then we went down to breakfast and I was like, oh, man, I'm feeling sick. I can't eat. And he's like, bro, you must have caught a bug. Not knowing what yeah. had gone on the night before. And then I was like, oh, well, went to the gym, bro. And I was pale white. And I couldn't train. I was feeling so crook. And I was just the worst gym ever. I wasn't playing. Corey was playing on the wing. So he was sweet as. He pumped through it. And I didn't. <laughs> we get back to the hotel. And Darren Chan, the All Blacks manager, is walking down the lounge, walking through the, the foyer. And he knocks us on the shoulder. And he's like, come in here. Well, oh, what's going on here? What have we, you know, what's happened? Mm. Not knowing, hundred percent not knowing what have we. Did on. you have any idea? No clue. What was your last memory? Was it the dinner? Being at the dinner, falling off my seat, falling off your seat. <laughs> That's it. Straight up, and they can't remember a thing. True. And then we walk in, and he's like, "Mate, you didn't pay for your taxi last night." Went, taxi? What taxi do we? Oh, I can't even remember a taxi. And he's like, yeah, you didn't pay for your taxi. Um, the hotel's fixed it up, so uh, just make sure you head up and, and pay for it. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, sweet, ass. <laughs> nice. We'll go back to the room. Next minute, knock on the door. Media manager, Joe Locke. Sup, Joey? Come in, brother. He's like, what have you idiots been doing? We're like, what? And he was like, mate, there's photos, there's footage, there's everything of you boys in town in Takapuna. At the Max Brewery Bar, behind the bar, one gender on, dart in the air, serving beers behind True. the bar. And we're like, hey, I do not remember a bar. Yeah. One but And, uh, yeah, so we went to this bar. We were behind the bar, can't remember. And then there was photos of that. And then, um, oh, there was just a lot of time there that just went blank. Can't really remember. And woke up the next day and... That all came out, that uh, Corey Jane and Israel Dag were in town, um, absolutely hammered, and can't remember any of it, and keep getting repeated. A and the worst thing about it is, I'm not proud of this, and it's, it seems like an occurring theme, but I was like, where's my car? <laughs> and I was like, car? It's not outside. So I walked down the bar, car's here, key's in it, Windows down, so I'd driven there oh, in the car. True. Yeah, bro. So could have absolutely killed someone, man. So dumb, so dumb. Um, yeah, not something I'm proud of. Feel embarrassed actually talking about it. Yeah, um, never really shared the story, but it's uh, it was a learning curve for me, and and you know just had to really grow up. And the worst thing about it is, my wife was like, "Come out for dinner with us tonight, hun." And I was like, "Nah, nah, I'm just gonna prepare for the quarterfinal." 
World Cup quarterfinal this week. I said, no, nah, I'll just chill. Well, I had to come clean straight away because it was yeah. front pages the next yeah. day. So I let her down, lied to her and, and said I was doing something different, but I didn't. And, um, yeah, that was a quarterfinal World Cup. Next week, got absolutely sprayed. Made to feel about this little in front of the team. Richie, Brad Thorne, Kevin Mialami pretty much nearly knocked our blocks off. Yeah, was did you have to go, what, sit down with the leadership group? Or how did, how did it work? Like? Oh, so back then, Wayne Smith wanted us gone, but... What, out of the team? One that's gone out of the team, but because it was World Cup, you can't bring people in and out. Oh, wow. So he was, by technicality. He was stuck with us, bro. <laughs> Otherwise gone. Israel Dag, World Cup, winner, no chance. Yeah. I would have been out the back door, but he couldn't. So we had to stay in and we had to cop it. We got just ripped to shreds for the whole start of the next week. We were playing Australia in the semi final. And then I would never played the World Cup anymore. Uh, if it wasn't for Mills getting injured in that oh, in his hundredth game, oh, he right. broke his um, I think it was hand or, or shoulder something happened, and he uh, he got injured. So I got an opportunity to to play against Australia, and the only way you repay the faith for your teammates is playing well. I was under so much pressure, man, mm-hmm. so much pressure, and me and Corey Jane um, had our best game that weekend against yeah, right. against Australia. Yeah. So I repaid the faith, but it was a hard week, man. Hardest week I've ever had in, in footy because I knew I'd just done wrong, yeah, and I felt that but that big. But only week, and the <laughs> after the game, Wayne Smith walks in, and we just carved up or played well. We beat Australia, probably my most clinical game I've ever played at rugby. And he just picks up a power aid and throws it at me, he says, Drink it. <laughs> and then after the final, he's like, You're lucky you played well. <laughs> <laughs> so Smithy It wasn't uh, I felt bad Because I let Smithy down it's A guy that's Done so much for me mm. But um, Yeah Not a proud moment There's You know A lot of lot of Blankness there Yeah and Mate it's, it's scary that you can Take a couple of pills like that And then just Go into some Mode Which you oh, cannot man. remember You don't even I can't remember being at a bar Yeah but Behind a bar Like but they had all the footage and all the... All have you the, seen the, the footage or have you seen some stuff from the night and been like, yeah, yeah, I've what? Seen that. And like someone, oh, I've met people down the down the road and they were in the bar and they were like, they said they were talking to me. Yeah. And they were like, you made no sense. Oh, true. And you were just blank and I was like, oh my God, that's so embarrassing. So yeah, lessons learnt. Um, some, some errors I've made along my journey mm. and I'm not proud of, but... You got to get through them and get through a bit of adversity and and yeah. But was was sleeping pills and tramadols and all that big part of? It's a big part of rugby, man. Yeah, it was a big part of rugby because like you're stuck in these hotels. It, there's no excuse, but there's there's a lot of external pressure you, you, that's put on you. So mm. for us, it was a legal way of getting away, like yeah, getting yeah, away yeah. from it all. Yeah, we abused it, no doubt, and it, and, it, and it was the correct talent now, which is which was needed because it was yeah. The the lads were abusing it yeah, and using right. them for the wrong way. And, you know, simple things of some guys wouldn't take them, so you'd be like, can we have them? <laughs> 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 yeah, okay. And then, oh, God, stop getting me a couple. <laughs> Don't tell them for me. <laughs> you know, just yeah. silly boy things, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah, not not proud of it. And um, I'm always going to say it because it's something that I'm quite embarrassed about. Yeah. As a father now, you know. Yeah. You kind of think, imagine if your kids or you knew your kids were doing that. Mm. And I'll show them that that clipping one day and say, "Don't you do this? Right? <laughs> you will not learn, learn the hard me, way. Yeah. <laughs> Don't learn from me." <laughs> mm. But you've you've come out um, like quite recently around you suffering with depression. Yeah, and was was that all part of it? Like, was the sleeping pills? Was that all part of the escape? Or when did you start noticing you had? Depression, or you were suffering with mental health. Um, it wasn't until I finished, eh? Like, oh, true. Just, just going. Well, that's when I really noticed because I just wasn't motivated, and yeah. I didn't want to um, get out of bed. And I was wondering why I, I just wasn't feeling happy. Yeah. Because well, on the outside looking in, I had everything I could ever dream of, mm. but on the inside, I couldn't find that one thing that could make me happy. You know, getting up and seeing my kids wasn't making me happy and and I guess it it just stems from just kind of understanding my purpose now mm. 
You know, Timmy B, t- Bateman spoke about it the other day, like your identity. And, and for me, rugby was my everything. Mm. And that's all I knew and that's all I thought I was. And it was. And when you finish, that's all taken away. And you're like, okay, what, what now? What do I do now? So it was kind of, which is hard for me to fathom because I had a job mm. at Sky Sport and I was still on the screens. But uh, uh, yeah, I just didn't. I just felt like I didn't have a purpose and, and an understanding and, and and a real reality of who I am yeah. and who I am as a person and, and my identity. And I'm still working on it. I still have so much self uh, self doubt of myself. Like yeah. I, it's because I'm in an industry now where it's kind of you are getting you are getting judged yeah. with everything you do yeah. anyway. Yeah, you know, I was getting judged on TV when I which way I was broadcasting. Like yeah. I'm the most. I've got the most fluent accent or I don't have the biggest vocabulary there to, to get me through. And, and I felt like I was getting judged for that. Yeah. The way I was calling games, I'm getting judged. Now I'm hosting a radio show and if things don't come out the right way, you seem, you've been seen as like you're dumb yeah, and, yeah. and you, sh- you don't even know how to speak. So there's still a little bit of that anxiety that goes through, through me on a daily. Uh, but I'm in a better place. Mm. I'm in a better place. And I think the thing that needs to work for me is I need to be active. Um, I've been dealing with weight problems since I finished rugby, and it's it's hard. Mm. Like I go and see people now, and they're like, "Jeez, you put on the beef," <laughs> and I like, I'm I can take it, but yeah. I'm like, man, if you say that to the wrong person, like, could yeah. go pretty yeah. pretty pear shaped. I feel so. like they say that to anyone. Like you go either way. Like, well, you haven't. Mate. I've gone skinny. <laughs> Everyone says, "Jeez, you've lost weight. Where's all your where's all your muscles yeah. gone?" And I like you look at Kieran Reid. I know he gets it as well, Richie. <sighs> These guys who go the skinnier side, but you know one thing I've noticed: what forwards go the other way, backs <laughs> go the other way, man. We've always been skinny our whole careers. When we finish, we're like, <laughs> when they they had to but maintain the the bulk, they go the other way. What is that? <laughs> True, eh? Yeah, hey? It is, except for me. Like, yeah. <laughs> I was always trying to bulk, and like once I've stopped, I'm like, this guy's so skinny, but. Uh, yeah, that's all part of it. <laughs> <laughs> but it is like, yeah, it's 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 a hard one. Like, if you look good, you feel good about yourself, you're going to have nice self-esteem yeah. and you're going to feel good. So for me, it's just trying to find that balance and, and put goodness in my body and mm. and maintain a, a physical lifestyle because it's something I've done forever. And when that's taken away from you, it's, it's hard. Yeah. So how did you handle injuries and stuff throughout your career, you know, when you, that has been taken away from you for – sort of six month periods instead of you know the end oh look it was it was difficult um because you always wanted to play but i i tell the story now to to players that are suffering long-term injuries it's Mm. like mate it's a paid sabbatical you know you've got to look at that longevity in the game you're never going to get these opportunities to have three or four months off because you constantly just played mate yeah you never you never get a paid leave so this is an opportunity for you to better yourself so for me when i had those forced breaks i just Took, made the most of it. I got away, and I, I had, you know, I just really took a step away from the game because mm. it's so in your face. This game mm. from from week to week, and, and it's you live and breathe it. So it's quite hard to to have that balance. But when you when you get injured, go away, find some balance, give you a good opportunity to to plan for the future, whatever it is, maybe do some travelling. Because there'll be a window. It's all part of the plan, return to play plan. There'll be a window for you to train extremely hard. So you might have like a a month or two window there where you can just get away and and relax. So do that, work extremely hard, and mate, there's no better opportunity where you are getting paid to train and to train as hard as much as you want and come back a better person and a better player. And that's the way I looked at it. Yeah, is mate, I've got four months here. Imagine if I can just work extremely hard in those four months, what I can be. And that's what I did in 2015. I got injured. I got dislocated my shoulder for Hawks Bay. I just got in dropped from the All Blacks for the World Cup. So, you know, I was already lacking confidence. But I got injured. I had six months out of the game. I went to America. Didn't watch one bit of rugby for a month and a half, two months. I came back. I had a four-month window. Me and Neil Tucker and John Roach and uh, Simon Thomas, the, the old Crusaders trainer, we just trained, bro. Trained mm. the hardest I've ever had to train. When I came back, bro, I was like, why didn't I do this in preseason? Yeah. Every preseason, I'd come back and I'd have to start from square run because, you know, you might have just cruised through summer. You just had a huge year. 
But I came back after that. I was fit. I was in the game. I had more touches than I've ever had, back-to-back yeah. touches. And it just, rugby was easy. Yeah. Instead of having to scrape your bum around that whole yeah. field for the first half of the year because you just hadn't done the work. So I say to players, like, if you have a long-term injury, it's a great opportunity to, to find that balance, but come back absolutely hissing. Yeah, it's hard for kids to understand that, eh? But mm. if you think about it now, imagine getting paid... <laughs> That coin to just train, <laughs> fully train your body oh. for four months. I'd be like, man, I'd take that yeah. any day. Didn't have any abs <laughs> still, mate. So I never had abs my whole career. So I was, you know, mud gut stag. But, <laughs> mate, came back fit as, fit as a fiddle and, and just, yeah, everything flourishing. I made the team again, man. Like, yeah. my proudest moment has been dealt that hand of I was playing poorly. I, I actually didn't deserve a chance to play in that 2015 World Cup. I was yeah. hopeless that year. And uh, it was a struggle, and I and I got dropped, and I nearly quit. Well, I actually nearly quit the game. And what nearly fully quit? Yeah, rugby. I said to Daisy, I said, "What oh, I've enough. Yeah, True. I said, I'm done. This sucks. Like I'm sick of walking down the street, looking at someone, and and these are what's going through my whole my mind. It's like, oh, he's like, he's looking at me like, oh, there's that Israel Dag, useless guy, got dropped from the All Black. Like that's what was going through my mind. Oh, and I was yeah. like, I'm done with that. I'm sick of that. I am more than rugby, and I just want to live a normal life. Mm. And then she was like, no, 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 calm down, just relax. You know, we'll just get to the end of the year, we'll go to America, we'll just chill, we'll have a holiday, and we'll just get away from it all and just just relax. So it wasn't for her, yeah, I would have finished, but proudest moment, I, I dug deep, and I came back, and I, f- I f- yeah, I just flourished, man, and everything started falling in place. And, and what had happened is, I put, like, that pressure I talk about, I put it all on me, mm. and I felt like I was playing for five million people, and... And trying to impress five million people, and I had the weight of New Zealand on my shoulders. So when I got injured and when I when I went away, I just came back and I was like, "Nah, I don't play for them." Yes, I do want to make them proud and, and happy, but the reason I play the game is for my mum, my dad, you know, my wife and my kid to be. Because my mm. wife got pregnant that mm. year with my son Arlo, so that really brought it home. As okay, this is my why, and this is why I do the things. And when I make a mistake. My why, they they won't have that expectation or pressure. They won't judge me for making that mistake or dropping the ball. So that pressure that I thought I had on me was, was irrelevant. And yeah, that year just flourished. I made the All Blacks again and had probably the best year I've ever had in the jersey. And and, and things yeah, panned out and, and the rest is history. Hey, it's crazy. It's crazy to hear that yeah. you potentially... Oh, we, we could it. have missed out <laughs> on those glory years because... I would have ended with no title, mate. <laughs> oh, imagine that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, true. So what year did you win the title? 2017. True. Yeah, I won my first title in 2017 with Razor and... Uh, yeah, was that your last year of Super? No, nah, no. Nah, 2019 was my last oh, year. Yeah. So, But 2018, I was... Uh, how do you say it? I was a uh, food bull. <laughs> <laughs> food bull, and then I went to South Africa in the 2018. Ah, uh, Japan, sorry. Yeah. And I came back in 2019. I retired, but I was still contracted. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I was still part of the team, but... Uh, so I claim... I claim one. Three to- I got you got three th- rings. I, I got three, but Corey Jane always wow. says you only played in one. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, I'll, I'll claim... I'll claim two. Yeah. No, fair <laughs> enough. And that first one... What, what one was that? South Africa. Oh, the Joe best Berg, one, like, apparently. Yeah, eh? That was the best title. Oh, the be- Probably one of the best things I've, I've done, apart from the world. Like, that is a special. To head to South Africa. And the worst, funny thing about that is Ray's actually knew that was going to happen. Mm. Like our theme was was themed in a way that we were going to South Africa and we were going to go to the jungle and we were going to go win this title. And yeah. it all happened and we went over there and we won it. And, man, it was an awesome moment. First title, you never ever forget that. Yeah, and winning that title, you won that in twenty sixteen, eh? 16, oh, 2015, 16, 16, yeah. yeah. Such a special time, right? right? Crazy. So you know, you know, lifting that trophy. I was actually quite happy when you lost the twenty fifteen. Because <laughs> 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 I don't want to deal with Corey Jane. <laughs> <laughs> no. oh. But that was an unreal game too, eh? Because you guys had a decent lead, or they they had a red card, and then yeah. they started coming home. <laughs> They came home pretty hard. You had to hang on there in those last few minutes. I went off after 50, so I can't really claim it. My, <laughs> my knee, bro, my knee is so bad. But it started jamming up. I had to get taken off. 50 minutes, yeah, and we hugged deep. And they made a little comeback towards the end. But, you know, Sam, uh, who was it? I think it met Todd. Or someone got a turnover in the end. And Richie Moyne kicked it out. And, oh. yeah, mate, it was, yeah, cool, cool moment. Like, that's... 
it's it's because you're in the middle of nowhere. You're surrounded by you know, your enemies, and you're just in this cauldron, and you get the game done. And then that night, that rest of those days, we didn't fly out for another day. Yeah, oh, it was a special <laughs> time to get you know pretty tight with the lads. And Monte Casino was it? Yeah, Monte Casino, <laughs> bit of everywhere. And then just for our flight, they came back with some um, KFC. Oh, that's Feed right. the boys up. We can't <laughs> let them get in on the plane with an empty tummy and just drink the whole way home. I actually came out and woke up in Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good trip. Great trip, but I'll never forget. 2017, so good. Oh, mate. So did you ever think about going overseas? I know you went to Japan, but was there ever an option for you to head over earlier or head yeah. to Europe or anywhere? I had, heaps. I had a, a few opportunities. So 2016, um, so 2015 when, when I obviously missed... The World Cup, when yeah, a lot think, of, think I was about thinking, oh, if I'm going to play, right. I might as well try and plan for the future and, and have a wee look overseas. So there was an opportunity to go to Toulon. Uh, that was that was yeah, yes, kind of humming and hiring. Uh There was an opportunity to go to Japan and play at Cannon oh, yeah. again, which yeah, where yeah. I, where I ended up in 2018 mm. anyway. But there was a genuine opportunity to go to Leinster, oh, Leinster yeah. over in Dublin. So I actually caught up with Leinster when we went there at the end of 2016. We played Ireland over in, in Dublin, and I went and caught up with Ethan Athewa and oh, yeah. and all the coaching staff there, and had a wee look around, and yeah, that was probably a real genuine opportunity and genuine chance for me mm. to head over. And I was humming and hurrying, but I just got back in the All Blacks. I was starting on the wing, I was playing well, and my contract had a lot of what ifs in it. Mm. If I did this, if I did that, you know, if I did this, you get this. So I said, ah, oh, wow. This is what I'm gonna got offered to go to Leinster. If you want me to stay, I'm I'm happy. I want to stay. I want guarantee, guarantee at all. So Steve Henson, you know, butter him up. Steve went over and and spoke to them all and uh, and obviously got it all guaranteed. So I stayed here, and then funny funny it happens the way the world goes was James Lowe actually went into Leinster. Oh, I took your contract. Took my contract and went over there. And now look at James Lowe. So yeah. they're so happy over there <laughs> because he's a way better buyer for Leinster and Ireland rugby at the moment. With James Lowe, what he's been doing. So. Oh, true. Yeah, I didn't end up going. And well, the, I came back here and, and ruined my knee in pre-season against the Hurricanes in Levin, I think, or somewhere. I don't oh, know so why. it was a moment. It wasn't just yeah. wear and tear. It was actually no, a, it was moment. a moment. Oh, man. true. Oh, that's why I can't understand these preseason games. We play them in these paddocks. Mm. You know, we're high performing athletes, and we go around. And I was playing in this paddock, bro, and I stood in a pothole, and, and I did hyper, hyper extended my knee, and that was a downward spiral. And that's when I did it in 2017, playing a preseason in Levin or somewhere for the hurric- uh, against the Hurricanes. We did it then, and after true. that, it just went, and it was downward spiral, man. Yeah, hey, that's crazy. I was, yeah, I try and talk about it because, I don't, yeah, these pre-seasons are important, but maybe just get them, get the games <laughs> where the fields are top-notch and, yeah. you know, you're not putting your body through hell. But, yeah, that's where it happened and, you know, we know what we we're at now. That was a downward spiral. That's kicks the, I've always had knock knee. I've always had a bad knee, but yeah. that little moment where I stood in the pothole just kind of accelerated the mm. the wear and tear and... Mm. And left me to where I'm at today. Hey, so a lot crazy. of what ifs going from my head, as you can tell. Yeah. And what if I didn't do that? <laughs> I might be still running around with Sam Whitelock. <laughs> no chance. Mate, you could be. Nah. <laughs> you could be. But then you do go to Japan, and it was just with a dodgy knee. So you already had a dodgy knee, but they, they signed you anyway. You got part, you snuck past oh, the medical. Just, yeah. I told them, I said, look, I've got a pretty bad knee and Alistair Kutsia the old South African coach was their coach Yeah, and I went over there bro and I was like I don't train I <laughs> just like uh, if you want me to play bro I just gotta have real managed trainings yeah. and uh, get through it so yeah I didn't play a hell of a lot and trained trained reasonable but we were doing watt bikes and rowing so I'd rather be training but um, didn't play a hell of a lot there played probably four games I was there for like three or four months hell of an experience what an amazing country that mm. is mm. So it was cool for experience. My what, my daughter was like three months. My son was, um, you know, a year and a bit. Yeah. And so we flew over as a young family, had a hell of a time. The rugby just wasn't meant to be. And then I played that last game against Panasonic. It was actually Matt Todd's team, Ash Dixon's team. And uh, we got pumped and I got smoked, you know. I got st- stood up defensively again. <laughs> got beaten and I went to kick that ball and couldn't kick it. And then I just left that game. I said, I've got to go back to New Zealand. Yeah, 
my knee is not good. I can't continue on. Went back to New Zealand, seeing Bruce Twaddle, Andrew Vincent, the surgeons, and they just said, look, you can't fix it. The only way we can fix it is osteotomy. We've got to break your leg. You cannot play again. Mm. And so I just got told I wasn't able to play rugby again and forced to retire. Mate. At 30 years of age. 30, yeah, 30. true. So, And that's when the sort of down, downhill spiral happened of... Who am I? Yeah. Gotta find yourself. Um, well, it's just like you gotta, you gotta earn, you gotta, gotta work again. And mm. yeah, I was just lucky that that Sky and I actually reached out to Sky and just said, look, I'm, I'm not playing much now. You know, if there's any opportunities to come and do some work, I'll be keen. And that's how it all kick started. And then they sure. offered me a contract for yeah. two two years. And then that happened. Then they offered me another contract for another year. And then went to renegotiate and a few things went on. I just said, oh, nah, it's not for me. So I'll just move on. So, yeah, that was and Here I am now. We have gone to our questions. We've gone to Instagram. Uh, plenty of questions have come in for you. Obviously, a lot of them were about that <laughs> Rugby World Cup incident. Man, what a story that was. Jeez, oh. it's blowing my mind. But um, <laughs> the next, next few, there's some good ones in here too. Um, first question. Can you bring back the Sea City brothers? Oh, bring them mate. back! <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> I can't believe I did that. I cannot believe it. Look, we raised some money for Child Cancer Foundation. That was that's what it was all about. But I got coerced into that did by you? our manager Dan Carter, uh-huh. and I can understand what he was doing. Yeah, he didn't have one bit of input. <laughs> didn't put his face on this team, so no one knows that Dan Carter was our actual manager of Sea City Brothers. <laughs> Um, so no, I will be not be making a comeback. Um, on oh, one imagine and two and back, done. Imagine them back on tour. It'd be awesome. I, I mentioned it to Willie Hines the other day. He was so <laughs> gutted. <laughs> Didn't really. They called us the Bold Brothers because we're all losing our hair. <laughs> so we're the Bald City Brothers. Oh my. Oh, Willie Hines is still bald. <laughs> but no chance. I'll never do that. But you did do the um, Air New Zealand video, so that was a oh. probably like, that was a big moment for you, eh? Like that was sort of when the World Cup was on, stardom. Oh, you've brought it back now. You brought it up. So that was at the time of the 2015 World Cup. So oh, we just done. What the was camp- it? 2015. We just done the campaign. Oh, it was from MIB. <laughs> You know, we're going to the World Cup. Yeah, let's go. And well, Israel Dag's not on that plane. True. So I, I was it was eleven, nah, twenty fifteen, oh, and it wow. was so embarrassing. Did that whole campaign? It was all good. I got heaps of flights and got paid for it, obviously. But yeah. but the worst thing was, um, yeah, I wasn't on that main flight when the team was flying oh, to England. True. I was yeah. stuck at home, licking my lips and licking my wounds, saying, oh, "I wish I was there." But um, yeah, so that was embarrassing. But it was good. It was good, man. I I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And something. did you write your lyrics? Nah, nah. nah. They both they brought choreographers down to Christchurch. Oh, I had to sure. full do like the Men in Black dance. I can't remember it one, but um, but it's quite a good party. Um, a party thing, you know. I go to parties and people chuck on Men in Black, oh, and I have to I have to rap. <laughs> Sit back, but let's let's go. Let's get this started. But before all this plane's departed, I'll be instructions from your crew. All that it sounds and placards to loose items. Your ball on board must be secured and safely stowed under the locker up ahead. Under the locker of a head or underneath the seat instead. Yeah, this right here's a seatbelt sign. So buckle up if it could shine. Bounce clips low across your hips. Just make it fits into it. That's something like that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> mate, I do I oh. do love a bit of live music. <laughs> mate, had Elijah Taylor rapping the other oh. day, but I think you might have even topped him. <laughs> nah, on that one, nah he's a good freestyle. I what watched a that performance. One. I watched that one. But um, yeah, embarrassing. And the worst thing is they ask you to, to do it on the flights. Oh, so yeah. I'd get on and I'd be like, nah. Oh. Uh, nah but hey, do you want to do it live? And I'm like, no chance. You all right? Play the video. <laughs> oh, embarrassing. <laughs> things I do, eh? <laughs> You're a yes man, though, eh? Oh, like, oh. You're always saying yes to things. Oh, right. mm. I said yes to this. There you go. <laughs> yeah, what a oh, lad. No, Let's mate, go. There he is, the legend himself. <laughs> okay, next one. Oh, you mentioned it around the. The C City brothers all balding, but what is the secret to growing my hair back? Someone's asked, and talk Ooh. me through this whole journey. Yeah, so I've started a company called Identity. Saw that. So obviously, Identity initials ID. Uh, it's just trying to help people find their identity back. I, I know how I know what it's like to lose your hair. It absolutely sucks. Um, so just offering the opportunity out there that there are options to get it done, and um, going bald is okay. 
But everyone thinks there'll be this magic formula out there, this potion that you can take and, mm. and you'll have your hair back. Well, there isn't. And the only way you can get your hair back is hair transplant. I had it done about five years ago. And basically, I had the FUE, which is they take a strip of your hair at the back. Um, they individually take each strand of hair. They call them grafts. Mm. And the graft might have one, two, three or four hairs in it. Uh, depending on, on how healthy they are, and then they put these grafts back in your balding spots, your areas. They do it in a way so it's not just planted, they actually have to look at the shape, the flow. So a guy called Vikram and his um, team will actually plant them in, and basically these grafts, because it's your tissue, 95% of your tissue will always reattach. Mm. And then these hairs, over a nine-month journey, just grow back like normal hair and... You're at a stage now where you've got a full crop and the rest is history and I've never thought I could ever have a fringe in my life. Yeah. Now I've got a fringe and I can shape it, I can mould it, I can do whatever and uh, everyone asks me like, what is it? I'm like, it's your own hair. Yeah. It's your hair and, and they take the hair from the back of your head. If you look at everyone that is going bald apart from Willie Hines because he shaves it off, um, they've got hair around the back of the head. So yeah. that is the healthiest hair on your body. And it's just like geography, you're taking the hair from the back and you're putting it in the balding spots and it'll grow back forever. Geography. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> I actually remember, like, you. I think you just had your... Um, oh, you ripped me out again. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> you just had your transplant against... Yeah. Uh, you, I was playing in Japan and you just had it and you were stoked. I remember seeing your face, yeah. like, when we were shaking hands after the game and you are just so stoked with your new hair and I was like, oh, that's cool. Got it done. It's yeah. quite cool to watch that journey. Like, you see it from being fully bald and then you, like, going through that... Because I just got it done and I went to Japan. Yeah. And you can see, like, little fluffs coming through, little fluffs... And and the best moment in my life was I used to grow the hair from the back forward and comb it forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I cut those bits off because oh, the hair yeah. had grown and I had, f you know, my crop back. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, something I'm, I'm proud of doing. And yeah. I think the more we normalise it, um, the better. Like like I said, going bald is, is okay, but there's a solution there, there's an option there, and, and you should be open about going down. Mm. I'm currently talking to people and they're just so embarrassed. They don't want people to know. I'm like, mate, well, you're going to shave it off and... You know, that's okay, but yeah. why not just go through this, get it done? A and I've got a big scar on the back of my head, so yeah. FUE is that surgery that I got done, but there's actually another option where I, um, it's called FUI, so they individually take the hairs out off the back of your head. It's like an apple core, they put it in, they pull out the grafts, oh, true. and it doesn't leave a scar. Yeah. And and they do it in a way so when the hair grows back, it's you don't even notice. It's just spread out across the back of your head and... You don't have the big scar across your baggy head. So True. if I shave it short, you'd be like, wow, who hit Izzy with an axe? Yeah. Because there's like this big scar. But, but you got hair, you're not going, but you're not shaving it off. Mate, right. if you're behind me, you're no good to me. So <laughs> front on, I look good, you know? <laughs> For the TV, mate, you're ready. <laughs> there you go. Look, at, and I always said when I was bored, I said, that's all that matters, you know? Yeah. As long as that's okay. <laughs> well, that's okay now, so we're good. <laughs> Oh, that's good. Well, if you are balding, make sure you do reach out to Identity and get that hair growing back like, like Izzy Dag has. Yeah, look, it's... Discount codes or... I'll, I'll look after you. Yeah. I'll look after you. You can't. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> look at that lid. Graying? <laughs> oh, I like Silver CJ. flocks. Because that's all CJ had, you know. Oh, here is the bald eagle, bald one, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, you're, you're grey. And all yeah. your hair come back. It's like, I don't care. I can dye that. So dye it. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't, though, does he? No. Nah. <laughs> growing it. Yeah. Okay. He's growing everything. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be like me now. Yes, yeah, Siege. <laughs> Okay, next one. Uh, what was going through your head when Pungo got his first win? Oh, my horse, Pungo. Um, pretty special moment, yeah. Pretty cool. Like, I, I've I've never really been into the horses. I like the odd punt, but when I started working with SCNZ, we talk horsing all day, every yeah, day. Yeah. So it was only fitting. And my good mate, Kurt, actually bought Pungo when he uh, bought him at the Ready to Run Sales. He bought all his mates in. So there's a good crew of us, Bodie nice Barrett. Guy. Yeah. Brendan McCallum, um, Mark Francis, there's a lady from Wellington called Nikki Krushank and Crookshank, and she's she's like the mother of the group. Yeah. We've got Carl Urban, you know, Star, oh, yeah. uh, sure. Star Trek. Sure. Sure. He's Kurt's neighbour, so he's a cool fella. A couple of guys that are very elegant, and um, yeah, so we've got a cool ass group that's part of this, so we're all on this journey, but man, it was such a good moment. Yeah. Like he won, 
And then he got entered into Derby Day in Australia. Like, that's the Saturday. They had played five Group 1s on Saturday, and then they had the Melbourne Cup Tuesday. Yeah. So we went over and watched him race in his third race. His favourite, wasn't he? Yeah, his favourite. Blew out. Oh, yeah. Blew out. <laughs> <laughs> Came sixth, I think. J-Mac on top. Um, look, it's, it's racing. He raced the other day. He came third. He was favourite again. I don't know. I think I hype him up and everyone follows me. <laughs> and he's just like, he shouldn't be favourite, but he is. Uh, but it's pretty cool, man. I yeah. hope you, you we're going to have some fun with him. Yeah. Okay, last question for us. Sorry, I've taken up a heap of your time, a lot it's more a than I promised. But uh, <laughs> ask everyone this question to finish the podcast. Best piece of advice you have for a Waterland listener? Oh, best piece of advice. Oh, man, I've been given plenty of advice over my life. Oh, look, I don't have really... One bit of advice that, that springs to mind for me. But um, one thing I'd say, and I struggle to do it even myself, is is, is actually find, find belief in yourself mm. and, and believe what you are doing is, is, is what you can achieve. And anything is achievable. Like, oh, I told the story throughout this whole podcast. Like, you know where I come from and the cards I've been dealt but I never stopped believing and I never stopped working hard for that, that, that goal to achieve it, that anything's possible, you know. It doesn't matter what book you are or what movie that, that you've been, you know, filming throughout your life, that anything is achievable. So just keep believing. And it's hard for me to say that because I still don't believe in myself, mm-hmm. but deep down I just continue to do what I do because I want to get to that, that end goal. And you may not never achieve it because it's unachievable, but as long as you stay connecting you stay on that path and that journey that you know is heading towards that direction that anything's possible so keep believing mate love it because like as we've heard through this podcast you've been in you've been in that situation like you're in the position where you you felt like the dream of being an all black was sort of too far but like you said you keep believing and even when you got there you felt you know it's all surreal and um, have fun too like yeah You've definitely done that. Oh, I've had plenty <laughs> of fun, man. Oh, well, we, what have I done? <laughs> it's all good, man. It's all good. What a late podcast. Thanks for having me, bro. You're an absolute champion. I'm proud of you, too, man. Like jumping into coaching is, is not an easy task, but you're absolutely nailing it, man. And keep up the good work. I appreciate it. And appreciate you giving up your time and coming on the no. podcast. And like, first podcast ever, mate. <laughs> You're going to be getting a few more requests after this. This is probably the greatest podcast ever recorded. <laughs> oh, I've just missed picking up the kids, but that's all right, mate. I'll be right. <laughs> mate, you're a lad. Appreciate it. Thanks, brother. What a lad, what a lad, what a lad, what an absolute lad.